The music video I did for Bleeding Rainbow came into being the same way many of my projects do. Just start making it, then figure out what's being made. If I plan things out too much in advance, I tend to get overwhelmed with the amount of work ahead of me, or I come up with something that's realistically too hard to put together on a small budget. So for this video, uh, I built some of the sets and shot some scenes before even really developing the plot. I guess I like to work aesthetically. Uh, the meaning is more secondary. It's, uh, it's not what does it take to tell the story. It's more like here's something beautiful and look what story it can tell. I'm not really a storyteller, more of an artist, but I think this film has, has a pretty neat story. Um, I put the whole thing together in two weeks, really. Uh, my sister, Dawn, connected me to the band. She sent me a text message saying that I should shoot a music video for this band, Bleeding Rainbow, and that they'd give me like a hundred bucks or something. So I said, sure, because that would be fun, love shooting things, and why not make a little money? Uh, you know, I was imagining uh, a one-day shoot, something really simple. Um, the members of the band saw some of my short films I'd done and asked me to do a stop-motion animated music video for them for 500. Uh, that's not a big budget, but you know, if I get a chance to shoot animation with that kind of budget, I can do it on film and not lose money doing it. So there's, you know, I I'm not going to turn that down. There was actually some deadline confusion. So originally the deadline was pretty tight. I think I was given a few weeks to do it. Uh, so I began building miniature sets and figuring out logistics. And before I'd even shot anything, they told me their label K9 Records was switching uh, distributors and the album release was being pushed back five months. So that took off all the pressure. Uh, that was definitely more time than I needed. Uh, and since I was in the middle of recording an album with my band Cadet, I shifted mostly, uh, I shifted my focus to that. I'd still work on the video a little bit every week, partly because I didn't want to lose too much steam on it and because I was working out of my room and I wanted it to be a room again, not an animation studio. I built the sets on my shelves, uh, which is a great way to do it because you have built-in floors and ceilings and walls to start with. And uh, all you have to do after that is just insert furniture and a character. Uh, so after taking it leisurely with the video, I got another email saying that the record company actually needed it done in two weeks. I hadn't really done much at this point, so I abandoned every other thing I had going on uh, and just focused on the video. Now everything takes four times longer than you predict. I knew that from working on other films with deadlines like Beasts of the Southern Wild and a music video for Darnay, uh, the song Already Loving You. I worked with my close friend Brendan Belomo on those and our saying when there's a tight deadline is, when you're awake, you work. When you're asleep, you dream about ways to solve things you can't figure out when you're awake or something to that extent. Uh, and this was a prime example of that. At the very end, I was sleeping three hours a night and working the whole day without breaks, except sometimes during a render. I thought, as long as this doesn't kill me, there isn't really anything stopping me from just pushing through and working really hard. And even though it was grueling, there was never a moment when it wasn't fun. So when the video was finished and I started to show a few people, they immediately asked how I did certain things, and that's the main reason I wanted to make this little documentary. I knew I wanted everything to have a really analog look to it, so every frame in the video went through some analog process. Almost all the stop motion animation was done on 35 millimeter film. I didn't actually own a digital camera at the time of the video, so in addition to loving the film look and process, a big reason for shooting it on film was uh, that that was all I had to work with. Um, if I'd had my choice, I would have shot it on 16 millimeter with a Bolex or something, but I didn't have one of those, and getting one would have eaten up the entire budget, so I shot it on my Nikon film SLR. Uh, you know, still camera. Shooting with such a big format uh, for animation has its advantages. Uh, all film has grain, and the bigger the format, if it's exposed correctly, the less grain you get, which helps with moving holds. And so the stop motion in this film, which is 12 frames a second, um, I would have shot at 24 frames a second if I had more time and money, uh, I think, but hey, Wallace and Gromit was 12 frames a second, and it looks fine. Actually, I guess it's 12 and a half because it's British, but anyway, you get a twelfth of, um, of a second of footage every time you take a picture. So because I was on a small budget, anytime there wasn't any action, uh, like a still shot where nothing is moving, like the character is sleeping, I just shot a single frame. Now a single frame can be repeated for however long you want, but it looks like a single frame being repeated, and it's very stale and lifeless and looks weird when everything just stops. 
the video still needs to breathe, so to speak. So I'd turn that one frame into many by adding variations to all the duplicates. Um, so grain, uh, because the, the grain is so fine with still film, you can remove that grain with uh, noise reduction software and still retain a lot of image detail. With a smaller format, it's harder to do that, and it was really essential to be able to remove grain for doing the moving holds. So I'd remove the grain and then add a similar grain back, but the grain that I was adding would uh, vary from frame to frame. Uh, that way it'd look like actual multiple frames being shot of the same, um, the same shot. So all the animation footage you're seeing is film, but there's a lot of digital trickery to make it look longer. It's harder than you think to match grain, though. Uh, for instance, there's a tighter grain structure in the highlights than in the shadows, and if you want to simulate that properly, it can take hours to fine-tune that, and it's, uh, it's not as simple as just throwing grain on top of an image. That would be brightness variation on a pixel-to-pixel -pixel basis. On film, the image is literally made out of the grain, which means every frame is like a painting, and a straight line under close inspection is a jagged trail of silver halides, and that trail is shaped a little differently on each frame. So the moving holds also have a sort of pixel jiggling applied to them. Uh, I won't bore you with how that was done, but... Um, but it, it helps. <laughs> Not that anyone could see that on the uh, on the internet <laughs> presentation of it, which is where it ended up. But you know, it's it's the right way to do it. Uh, and also, I'd, I'd add brightness variation and a little bit of camera shake so that they jiggle a little. Because you know, unlike a digital camera, uh, when you're when you're working with film, every frame um, is not quite centered perfectly. There's a little jiggle to it, um, and so. Uh, also, uh, I would add little specks of dust and hairs. Uh, I wrote a little program to put those in there sort of randomly. Um, yeah, that helped. Gave it some life, too. Now, film is great, but it's no secret that it's harder to work with um, in terms of the workflow. Because um, you can't see it immediately, and you have to go get it developed. And so every, every time I would shoot a scene... And I would run through a number of uh, number of roles. Uh, I would go bike down to uh, the photo lab and and get it developed. Um, and then I'd come back and I'd have to scan it. And you know, scanning. Um, I don't have a good film scanner, particularly, or at least uh, it's a, it's an okay film scanner, but it doesn't um, it doesn't have digital ice. Um, which is a technique for removing scratches and hairs and dust um, that end up on all film no matter what. There's no <laughs> way to keep film <laughs> uh, clean. It always gets those on it. And, you know, that's part of the charm of it is that it has that. Uh, what I'd have to do is I'd have to paint those out on every frame um, for this video because the deadline was so extreme. Uh, there's a lot of footage that... <laughs> It has a lot of scratches and hairs, and I felt for this aesthetic, that's fine. Um, so I just left it on there. Unfortunately, when I was working on this uh, video and I had to go bike to get this film developed, it was oftentimes some of the hottest days of the year. Ugh. And so I would be racing against the clock trying to get to the labs before they would close uh, to get the film dropped off so I could pick it up the next day. Um, and just sweating, uh, getting sunburned. And uh <laughs> because my room was such a mess from being transformed into a film studio, I, I was actually sleeping in another room. I would uh, stay up till 8 in the morning working and then go to sleep. I would set my alarm for like an hour but I would sleep through it and wake up at 11, which is not much better. I would sleep in a different room just on the couch because I needed separation from the studio. Um, and my bed was, it probably had tripods and shit on it anyway. 